Hey guys, my name is Gabby. Welcome back to my channel. And today I wanted to share with you some of my favorite book passages of all time. These are kind of like my favorite book quotes, but they're a lot longer. I am still planning on doing a favorite book quotes video at some point in the near future, but I thought I would make a video specifically dedicated to my favorite book passages. I have about seven books here that I wanted to read different passages of the book from to you. Some of these book passages are my favorite because of the writing and just how beautiful and like metaphorical it is, but then also some of them are a lot heavier and deal with a lot of heavy topics that just really like made me think and are just really beautiful and thought provoking to talk about. So, so I thought I'd start with the lighter passages and then slowly make my way into the heavier deep ones. <laughs> so one of my favorite passages is from Unteachable by Leah Rader. It's on page five. It's like one of the very first things, but it's one of my favorite passages because it's just so beautiful in the way that it describes love. So this one says, I'm not going to do the whole roller coaster falling in love metaphor. I didn't fall in love with him up there. Maybe I fell in love with the idea of love, but I'm a teenage girl. This morning I fell in love with raspberry jam and a puppy in a tiny raincoat. I'm not exactly Earth's top priority on the subject, but when we crested the first peak and the world sprawled beneath us like a tangled up string of Christmas lights, and then we plunged toward it at light speed, the guy and I reached for each other's hands spontaneous spontaneously and simultaneously. And it felt like something I've never felt before. You can call it love or you can call Call it free fall they're pretty much the same thing and that is one of my favorite passages about love and the idea that like love is like a free fall like a roller coaster like i just love it so much it gives me chills another one of my favorite passages actually comes from red white and royal blue this is like probably my most recent read on this whole list but one of my favorite passages is kind of like towards the end this isn't spoilery at all though this passage is actually about losing a parent and like that's and like the grief that the child faces when they lose a parent like that's what this quote is about this passage it says so imagine we're all born with a set of feelings some are broader or deeper than others but for everyone there's that ground floor a bottom crust of the pie that's the maximum depth of feeling you've ever experienced and then the worst thing happens to you the very worst thing that could have happened the thing you had nightmares about as a child and you thought it's all right because that thing will happen to me when i'm older and wiser and i'll have felt so many things by then that this one worst feeling the worst possible feeling won't seem so terrible but it happens to you when you're young it happens when your brain isn't even fully done cooking when you've barely experienced anything really the worst thing is one of the first big things that ever happens to you in your life it happens to you and it goes all the way down to the bottom of what you know how to feel and it rips it open and carves out this chasm down below to make room and because you were so young and because it was one of the first big things that happened in your life you'll always carry it inside of you every time something terrible happens to you from then on it doesn't just stop at the bottom it goes all the way down and i think that that quote is really beautiful like in i mean in this sense it's talking about the loss of the parent on a child but i think that that quote is really beautiful and really true for like any horrific thing that happens to a child that traumatizes them for the rest of their lives and that one got pretty deep we just jumped right into the deep <laughs> next i thought i would share with you a passage from we are the ants that is just like my favorite this passage from we are the ants is like actually the first entire three pages so but like listen if this passage doesn't convince you to read this book then i don't know what will so this is the very first opening passage of this book life is bullshit Consider your life for a moment. Think about all those little rituals that sustain you throughout the day, from the moment you wake up until the last lonely midnight hour when you guzzle a gallon of NyQuil to drown out the persistent voice in your head, the one that whispers you should give up, give in, that tomorrow won't be better than today. Think about the absurdity of brushing your teeth, of arguing with your mother over the appropriateness of what you're wearing to school, of homework, of grade point averages, and boyfriends, and hot school lunches, and life. Think about the absurdity of life. When you break down the things we do every day to their component pieces, you begin to understand how ridiculous they are. Like kissing, for instance. You wouldn't let a stranger off the street spit into your mouth, but you'll swap saliva with the boy or girl who makes your heart race in your pit sweat and gives you boners at the worst fucking times. You'll stick your tongue in his mouth or her mouth or their mouth and let them reciprocate without stopping to consider what else their tongue has been or whether they're giving you mouth herpes or mono or leftover morsels of their tuna salad sandwich. We shave our legs and pluck our eyebrows and slather our bodies with creams and lotions. We starve ourselves so we can fit into the perfect pair of jeans. We pollute our bodies with drugs to increase our muscles so we look ripped without a shirt. We drive fast and party hard and study for exams that don't mean dick in the grand scheme of the cosmos. 
Physicists have theorized that we live in an infinite and infinitely expanding universe and that everything in it will eventually repeat. There are infinite copies of your mom and your dad and your close dealing little sister. There are infinite copies of you, despite what you've spent your entire life believing you are not a special snowflake. Somewhere out there, another you is living your life. Chances are, they're living it better. They're learning to speak French or screwing their brains out instead of loafing on the couch in their box or stuffing their face with bowl after bowl of fruity oat holes while wondering why they're all alone on a Friday night. But that's not even the worst part. What's really going to send you running over the side of the nearest bridge is that none of it matters. I'll die, you'll die, we'll all die, and the things we've done, the choices we've made, will all amount to nothing. Out in the world, crawling in a field on the edge of some bullshit town with a name like Shoshani or Medicine Bow is an ant. You weren't aware of it. Didn't know whether it was a soldier, a drone, or the queen. Didn't care if it was scouting for food to drag back to the nest or building new tunnels for wriggly ant larvae. Until now, that ant simply didn't exist for you. If I hadn't mentioned it, you would have continued on with your life pinballing from one tedious task to the next, shoving your tongue into the bacterial minefield of your girlfriend's mouth, doodling the variations of your combined names on the cover of your notebook, waiting for electronic bits to zoom through the air and tell you that someone was thinking about you, that for one fleeting moment you were the most significant person in someone else's insignificant life. But whether you knew about it or not, that ant is still out there doing ant things while you were waiting for the next text to prove that out of the 7 billion self-centered people on this planet, you are important. Your entire sense of self-worth is predicated upon your belief that you matter, that you matter to the universe, but you don't, because we are the ants. And uh, yeah, that first passage is the reason why this book is my all-time favorite book. That is just so my mindset on things, like why, like none of this matters, you know? Like I just, I love it so much. So I think if you enjoy that passage, you'd really enjoy this book because it's just, it's so great, okay? It's so great. <laughs> I think the only logical way to do the next passage would be from The Humans by Matt Haig because this book is the most similar, I think, to We Are The Ants and it has that same like nothing fucking matters vibe. This book actually has an entire book that I think is worthy of amazing quotes and amazing passages, but one of my personal favorite passages from this book is on page 141. It says, consider this, a human life is on average 80 earth years or around 30,000 earth days, which means they are born, they make some friends, eat a few meals, they get married or they don't get married, have a child or two or not, drink a few thousand glasses of wine, have sexual intercourse a few times, discover a lump somewhere, feel a bit of regret, wonder where all the time went, know they should have done it differently, realize they would have done it all the same, and then they die into the great black nothing, out of space, out of time, the most trivial of trivial zeros, and that's it, the full caboodle, all confined to the same mediocre planet. <laughs> that is just, in a nutshell, what I really love about this book and what I love about We Are the Ants. They both have this vibe about like pointing out how absurd human life is, if you really think about it. I also really like this one quote slash passage that this book has about love because this alien in this book, this book follows from the point of view of an alien and he just doesn't understand love and affection. Like he just doesn't get it. I love this quote that he says about it. And he says, love is scary because it pulls you in with an intense force, a super massive black hole, which looks like nothing from the outside, but from the inside challenges every reasonable thing you know. You lose yourself like I lost myself in the warmest of annihilations. This other quote that I really love about this book is talking about why it makes sense that people would believe in a god because like I'm personally not a religious person myself and I don't believe in a god but this is his like way of like breaking it down like why he thinks other people would believe in a god and this passage like really opened my eyes and made me think a little bit differently too. I looked at Isabel and I saw a miracle. It was ridiculous, I know, but a human in its own small way was a kind of miraculous achievement in mathematical terms. For a start, it wasn't very likely that Isabel's mother and father would have met. And even if they had met, the chances of their having a baby would have been pretty slim given the numerous agonies surrounding the human dating process. Her mother would have had about 100,000 eggs ovulating inside her and her father would have had 5 trillion sperm during that same length of time. But even then, even that one in 500 million 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 chance of existing Existing was a terrible understatement and nowhere near did the coincidence of a human life justice. You see, when you looked at a human's face, you had to comprehend the look that brought that person there. Isabel Martin had a total of 150,000 generations before her, and that only includes the humans. 
that was 150,000 increasingly unlikely copulations resulting in an increasingly unlikely children. That was a one in quadrillion chance multiplied by another quadrillion for every generation, or around 20,000 times more than the number of the atoms in the universe. But even that was only the start of it, because humans had only been around for 3 million Earth years, certainly a very short time compared to the 3.5 billion years since life first appeared on this planet. Therefore, mathematically rounding things up, there was no chance at all that Isabel Brink could have existed. A zero in ten is the power of forever chance. And yet, here she was, right in front of me. And I was taken back by it all, I really was. Suddenly it made me realize why religion was such a big thing around here. Because sure, yes, God could not exist, but then neither could humans. So if they believed in themselves, the logic must go, why not believe in something that was only a fraction more unlikely? I think I just like this quote so much because like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like humanity itself seems so impossible. And so it's like, why not believe in something just a tad bit more impossible? You know, like that makes sense to me. Like that was very interesting. And that's why especially I really like this quote at the end because of that quote, it kind of like relates to that. And it says, you shouldn't have been born. Your existence is as close to impossible as can be. To dismiss the impossible is to dismiss yourself. So the next quote is also going to be about religion because, you know, why not keep going with the whole God thing? <laughs> but this one is from The Immortalist by Chloe Benjamin, and this one is also one of my favorite quotes about God or, like, religion or whatever because it just... It just really like speaks to me. So it says, his belief went willingly, logically, the way the boogeyman disappeared once you looked under the bed. That was the problem with God. He didn't hold up to a critical analysis. He wouldn't stand for it. He disappeared. Talk of religion, it can make people uncomfortable or defensive. And then he goes on to say, in a way, I see religion as a pinnacle of human achievement. In inventing God, we've developed the ability to consider our own straits and we've equipped him with the kind of handy loopholes that enable us to believe we only have so much control. The truth is that most people enjoy a certain level of impotence, but I think we do have control so much that it scares us to death. And as a species, God might be the greatest gift we've ever given ourselves, the gift of sanity. And then it goes on to say, I suppose I think we need God for the same reason we need art, because it shows us what's possible. I think that's kind of similar to the last quote too, because it's saying like, to dismiss the impossible is to dismiss yourself. And it's saying like, we need God for the same reason we need art, to show us what's possible. It's like, it's all about this idea of like, believing in what's possible, and not, necessar not necessarily believing in something you know to be true. I don't know, I just, I just really, really love that quote as well. My next favorite book passage is from This Is How It Always Is by Lori Frankel. And this passage in particular deals with parenting and how you never really know when you're making the right decision for your child. So this is when the main character is speaking in regards to their child. And he said, when was the last time you absolutely knew what was wrong and what should be done to fix it and how to make that happen? And she says, as a parent, never. And he says, never, not ever, not once. You never know, you only guess. This is how it always is. You have to make these huge decisions on behalf of your kid, this tiny human whose fate and future is entirely in your hands, who trusts you to know what's good and right and then be able to make that happen. You never have enough information, you don't get to see the future, and if you screw up, if with your incomplete, contradictory information you make the wrong call, well nothing less than your child's entire future and happiness is at stake. It's impossible, it's heartbreaking, it's maddening, but there's no alternative. And I think that that's one of my favorite quotes and passages in a book ever because I just love the way that this talks about parenting and it points out that parents never have the right answers for their children and they're always just doing the best that they can to make sure their child is safe and happy but they can't see the future and like i just think that that's so beautiful and so true when i was growing up i just thought they were these like superheroes who just like had all the right answers and would always be there to save the day and it's like it just opened my it just opens my eyes i guess and makes me realize that parents are humans and they make mistakes and that they're always just learning and trying to do their best and i think that's why i really love this quote so much all right and the last book that i wanted to share with you some passages from is a little life by Hanya Yanagihara. This is like one of my favorite books of all time, like absolute favorites ever. But I will warn you, it is the most depressing book of all time, for sure. It's not spoilery by the way, but it is another passage that's kind of about a parent to a child, but it's about what happens when a child dies unexpectedly and the parent has to like try to figure out how to cope and move on with their life. It's just one of the most eerie and beautiful book passages I've ever read in my life. And I honestly think about this 
all the time. <laughs> you have never known fear until you have a child. And maybe that is what tricks us into thinking that it is more magnificent because the fear itself is more magnificent. Every day, your first thought is not, I love him, but how is he? The world overnight rearranges itself into an obstacle course of terrors. I would hold him in my arms and wait to cross the street and would think how absurd it was that my child, that any child could expect to survive this life. And then he says, when your child dies, you feel everything you'd expect to feel. Feelings so well documented by so many others that I won't even bother to list them here, except to say that everything that's written about mourning is all the same. And it's all for the same reason, because there is no real deviation from the text. Sometimes you feel more of one thing and less of another, and sometimes you feel them out of order, and sometimes you feel them for a longer or shorter amount of time, but the sensations are always the same. But here's what no one says. When it's your child, a part of you, a very tiny but nonetheless unignorable part of you, also feels relief because finally the moment you have been expecting, been dreading, been preparing yourself for since the day you became a parent has come. Ah, oh, you tell yourself, it's arrived, here it is, and after that you have nothing to fear again. Ooh, that is a heavy, heavy, heavy one right there, but I feel like I've never considered that point of view before, like the idea that a parent might feel a tiny amount of relief when their child dies because yeah, then you literally have nothing to fear ever again. Like it makes me want to cry and just like gives me chills when I read that quote. Like it's so like sad. I also really, really love this passage that talks about relationships and why society is so obsessed with us being in romantic relationships as opposed to just having a lot of friendships. And he says, but how was one to be an adult? Was couplehood truly the only appropriate option? Thousands of years of evolutionary and social development and this is our only choice. He took pleasure in his friendships and it didn't hurt anyone, so who cared if it was codependent or not? And anyway, how is a friendship any more codependent than a relationship? Why was it admirable when you were 27 but creepy when you were 37? Why wasn't friendship as good as a relationship? Why wasn't it even better? It was two people who remained together day after day, bound not by sex or physical attraction or money or children or property, but only by the shared agreement to keep going, the mutual dedication to a union that can never be codified. Friendship was witnessing another slow droop of miseries and long bouts of boredom and occasional triumphs. It was feeling honored by the privilege of getting to be present for another person's most dismal moments and knowing that you could be dismal around him in return. And I love that so much because I do feel like it's ridiculous how society tries to like pressure everyone into being in a romantic relationship and how like, yeah, like how he said, like it's admirable when you're 27 and you're single, but if you're 37 and single, it's like no longer acceptable for whatever reason. Anyways, I could go on and on with like a million different passages from this book because this book's 800 something pages long and I highlighted and marked up almost like every single page in this book because it's just so beautiful. Those are some of my favorite book passages of all time. Again, like I said, I am still planning on doing a separate video just for book quotes, like the book quotes that are like really short and like only one or two sentences long. <laughs> But I just wanted to share with you some of my favorite book passages of all time because I just think that they're really beautiful and really powerful and I love when a book passage can like make me think about something in a different way and I do think about almost all of those on a daily basis like they're just so beautiful. Yeah so if you would like to you can share with me some of your favorite book passages or if you also have book passages from those books that I mentioned that I didn't mention in this video you can like let me know which ones are your favorites. Most of my favorite books of all time have like a really beautiful passage that like sticks with me and I think of that passage when I think of that book. And so for all of those books, like those are all of some of my favorite books of all time because of those passages. Thank you guys so much for watching as always. I hella appreciate you and I will see you soon with a new video.